Okay, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our latest webinar from the Northwest branch of the Nautical Institute, Northwest and Wales. Ian always reminds me about the Wales part as well, but Northwestern Wales. Uh, so, our speaker this evening, Commander Jonathan Heach, Executive Officer of the NOAA Fisheries of Office of Science and Technology. That's a mouthful at this time of the evening. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, previously, he was assigned as the Commanding Officer of NOAA. Ship Ruben Lasker, which I'm sure we're going to hear about shortly, responsible for NOAA's newest, most technology advanced research ship. He carried out crit critical fishery surveys on the North American West Coast. Prior to his command, Toy filed operational safety and training roles to the Deputy DPA, ISM Auditor, Chief of Port Operations, and multiple other aspects. Uh, prior to that, enlisted US Marine for nine years, serving the 31st. Experiencing, and I'd like to welcome as well as a fellow chartered master mariner. There's a few on the call this evening, I see as well. So, uh, a, a, another limited number of people there on that chartered side as well. So, uh, Jonathan, hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem, Adrian. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, uh, you know, Chris, for getting this all set up, and then also uh, Stephen Gosling at NI headquarters, who kind of made the connection initially so uh so uh, i i appreciate that and honored to be able to speak this evening um again you know this is uh kind of a discussion about noah uh nothing official as they say but uh you know again uh, i want to be able to uh, you know be honest with you on, on on how things are set up and some of the challenges we face and whatnot um and uh, again they're my personal opinions and perspectives. Uh, so I always got to give that wonderful little disclaimer uh, before we get started. Um, overall, this evening, we're going to cover um, a little bit about me and my background, kind of unique. Um, and then we'll delve into the NOAA mission and how NOAA is uh, arranged. It truly is one of the most unique organizations in the world. Uh, in my humble opinion, uh, it's it's kind of a conglomeration of things. So I want to go through that conglomeration so you have an idea uh, of, of what's all involved. And then I'll move more into the spe specifics around the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations uh, and what we do in that area, um, as well as Ruben Lasker, uh, my, my old ship. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to give a presentation well, certainly no issue if you want to ask questions. I do hope that we'll have a decent period uh, on the backside there where we can we can ask away, but certainly no issue to not throw it in the chat or whatever, and we can come back to it at the end. So without further ado, uh, yeah, I will know this is I'm the executive officer of NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology. Uh, as you can see, I am very much in a uh, uniform. Uh, the NOAA Corps is kind of a, a unique part of NOAA. Uh, we are commissioned officers just like a Navy or a U.S. Coast Guard officer, um, and we serve in various roles. And so they move us shore, sea, shore, sea. And I am in a shore billet that has basically nothing to do uh, with anything maritime, which is really painful for me. Uh, but needless to say, um, I'm, I'm here and uh, doing my time. <laughs> So without further ado, uh, a little bit about myself. Let me, there we go. So that little red arrow there, uh, Sioux Falls, uh, Minnehaha County, South Dakota, is where I was born. So uh, as you can see, geographically speaking, uh, not exactly the most robust maritime tradition coming out of uh, South Dakota. Um, I had never seen the ocean. Um, I, I'd seen rivers and lakes occasionally, and they were usually very brown and muddy. And, uh, and that was about the extent of it. Um, but uh, shortly after graduating high school, I, I joined the United States Marine Corps, and I went to a wonderful place called San Diego uh, and uh, saw the ocean for the first time, uh, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. But at the time, I was very focused on what I was doing as a Marine. Originally, I was with uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, which is an infantry battalion. So we were doing infantry things, blowing things up and hanging out in the field and doing all that fun stuff. Um, but eventually, we ended up going on ships. So uh, this right here is the Bella Wood on top and the Essex on the bottom. 
that picture with the 9-11 let's roll in true uh, robust American fashion um, was actually when I was on it. Um, that, that, that took place right after 9-11. Uh, and I was actually in Okinawa at the time, and we hopped on the ship and headed out. Um, so originally Essex was my, my first experience. And uh, if you don't know, you know, U.S. Marines, when we go on to Navy ships, uh, they tend to stuff us down uh, in our little birthing areas and tell us don't touch anything. And, uh, you know, you, you can come up to eat. And other than that, stay away and don't mess with anything. Um, so the Navy didn't really like us wandering around. Um, I, however, wanted to wander around. <laughs> and so uh, I went for a walk one day and I was probably going to places that I shouldn't have gone. And um, I went through one of the, the exterior doors and I ended out uh, on, a, uh, on a walk that went under the flight deck. And... I remember that being such a, a, a formative moment for me where I kind of looked out and all I could see was the horizon and water. And then I looked down and I just saw, you know, the bow weight coming off the bow and saying to myself, this thing is made of metal. Uh, how, why is it floating? <laughs> how are we going so fast? This is mind blowing. And it was just something that was so foreign to me growing up in South Dakota that made me say, I want to learn more about ships. So needless to say, uh, a little bit of time on the Essex and then uh, later on, I was or sorry, on the Bell Wood. Later on, I was on Essex and Essex is where I, I, I did a lot more of my, my shipboard training on there. So even as a Marine, um, I went down, I tried to do what's called the enlisted surface warfare uh, qualification. And uh, so you go around, you learn all about the ship. Um, they thought I was crazy. Um, I never was able to finish it for a multitude of reasons, timing primarily, uh, the fact that I had to go fight a war in Iraq. Uh, but they did qualify me as a helmsman. They qualified me as a lookout, um, qualified me as a, a deck seaman, because um, I went down there and I I'd, I'd learned how to splice and done a bunch of stuff when I was on shore. And uh, they, they all thought it was very intriguing that a Marine uh, was was wanting to learn about ships. So moving forward, um, I eventually did what's called a lateral move and I got out of the infantry side of the house and I became a weather forecaster. Uh, so I went to weather school, uh, which is about a year long school, pretty intense, but it was also great because it was worth a lot of uh, college credits. And so I kind of put that to work and uh, was able to achieve my degree while I was still on active duty. And I was seriously considering going over to the Navy because that's what I was familiar with. That's what I saw, knew, and, and experienced. Um, so I went to the Navy, and they were like, cool, we'd love to have you as an officer, but, you know, you'll make a great METOC officer, METOC, Meteorology and Oceanography. And I said, cool, that's nice, but I want to drive ships. And they're like, yeah, 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 no, 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 you can't do that. We're, you're going to be a METOC officer. And I'm like, I don't like this. Um, in that process, I, I eventually found, uh, you know, NOAA and, and the NOAA Corps, um, and I had ended up visiting a ship that was actually in San Diego called the David Star Jordan. She's no longer around. Um, but when we, when I went down there and visited, I saw what they do. And one of the things that NOAA Corps officers do do is drive ships. Um, because our ships tend, the way we operate is nothing like the Navy. We operate much more like the Merchant Navy. And ultimately, you know, we have a watch officer and a lookout on the bridge and we do the maritime things. So, um, like I said, while I wear the uniform and I'm a commissioned officer and stuff, the way we operate our ships, while very unique, um, is still much more on the maritime uh, you know, the, the civilian maritime side of the house and the military side of the house. So ultimately I said, hey, cool, I'm going to join this no core thing. And I did, they accepted me, went to school. We can talk about school later if you want to get into that. I'm not going to get into those particulars unless you want to later. Um, but I joined NOAA. And again, you know, NOAA's mission is, you know, sum summarized as science, service, and stewardship. Uh, you know, we are a 
science agency, not that we actually can, we conduct science, um, but we gather data and we use that data in order to ensure that we can provide the services that the government needs to provide to the people um, that are out there in, in, a, in a variety of areas. We're going to go into those areas in a little bit. And ultimately that falls under the stewardship of our oceans and atmosphere. So as the, 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 the seal says, I'm assuming you can see my, uh, my, my arrow there, but uh, it's oceanic and atmospheric. We are concerned about the oceans and the atmosphere and technically the Great Lakes. Um, <laughs> it's a long, long story there, but uh, in certain areas, at least from a coastal perspective, we, we talk about the Great Lakes, but when it comes to fisheries and stuff, we're not concerned about, you know, the perch in a river somewhere. We are strictly focused outward from the land. We are looking at the ocean and then obviously the, the atmosphere above us. Um, you'll see there at the bottom, it says U.S. Department of Commerce. And I will touch on that real quick because a lot of people always ask, say, oh, so you're DOD, uh, Department of Defense. And it's like, no, 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 we're Department of Commerce. And everyone's like, that, why, why? What does this have to do with commerce? Well, we all know what it has to do with commerce. You know, uh, the impacts of weather on the environment is significant. So the Weather Service falls under NOAA. Fisheries, we all know that landing of fisheries is a significant, uh, you know, um, producer of, of income, which we'll go into a little bit later and whatnot. So it falls under commerce um, and it's kind of a strange fit, uh, but it seems to work for the most part. So again, you can, you can read down below, that's kind of the expansion of science service and stewardship, um, but ultimately uh, that's what we do. In true uh, government fashion, uh, we have this wonderful flow chart. Um, well, org chart, I guess, not technically a flow chart. Um, we're not going to worry about the top part too much, and I've got a much better portion of the bottom part. Uh, the upper part is a lot of that fun government bureaucracy, um, which I'm not a fan of, but it's a thing that exists. Um, but what I'm concerned about primarily is the part that says line offices. So, <clears throat> again, history of NOAA. NOAA was created back in the 70s. Uh, and I, I want to say it was 77, I'm pretty sure, 77 or 73. Um, but ultimately, when it was created, they just kind of took all these different things that existed in the government uh, and kind of threw them all into NOAA. Um, for a while, there was even discussion like, hey, let's put the Coast Guard in NOAA too. Uh, and then they decided against that. They left them in the Department of Transportation. Eventually, I moved to Homeland Security, but, you know, the government, um, I don't think it really depends on the country. They're all um, operate in a very unique fashion, uh, dare I say. So uh, in this, you see, we've got these six primary line offices, uh, National Marine Fishery Service, which I'm technically a part of right now, National Ocean Service, NEDIS, which is the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, OAR, um, which is also called NOAA Research, and then, of course, the National Weather Service. Last but not least is OMAO. We're going to spend more time on them later. Uh, so what we're going to do here, and please let me know. I'm going to click on this link. And I'm assuming you can see it says about us. Everyone can see that? Okay. So this is NOAA Fisheries About Us, and I'm actually going to include the links here in the chat momentarily um, about what we do. Um, and then this way you can look at this afterwards all you want. But ultimately, NOAA Fisheries is responsible for the stewardship of our ocean resources and their habitat. So that can include a variety of things. All of our uh, you know, protected species and everything else falls under NOAA. And then we also track a lot of our, our, our fisheries items. Um, so like here, we talk about the economic impacts of, you know, fisheries in the United States. So like in my office of science and technology, we do, we actually have a whole economics uh, division that has a bunch of statisticians that work for us that, you know, gather all the data that's coming in from the fisheries landings and seeing how it applies to the economy. So it kind of ties back into the whole Department of Commerce stuff. So uh, again, you know, like I said, I'm not going to go through this too much, but I will send the links to you shortly if anyone wants to look uh, at, the, at the particulars. 
Um, but again, like I said, fisheries is related to, you know, anything related to fish and living marine resources in the ocean. National Ocean Service, I'm going to come back to because it's a little bit longer and drawn out. They're a very strange little line office. Um, but NESDIS uh, is our National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. And uh, this, this, this right here, this, this background picture, that's actually where I officially work. I'm in my, my home office now, but, uh, but that's NOAA headquarters up in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, but basically what, uh, what NESDIS does is NESDIS at a glance is it operates all of our, our weather uh, satellites, uh, which we actually have quite a few, and maintains a, a constant watch on all things related to the satellites. So second to NASA, um, we, we have the most, most spacecraft uh, up in the atmosphere. Uh, oh, and outside of DOD, of course, because, you know, DOD. Um, but ultimately, they, they develop, you know, a lot of the, the critical data and operational products. And they also control a lot of our, like, internal computer systems. We have some significant computer systems within, like, the National Weather Service um, that, are, that are used to, uh, you know, sit there and, and, and calculate what's going to happen in the future, you know, in the weather. Um, and so they also maintain a lot of those computers. Um, doo -doo -doo. Up next, we have OAR, uh, Office of uh, Atmospheric, uh, well, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Um, ultimately, not really that exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, they support a lot of research. So in order to make our tools better, you know, to predict weather or protect uh, you know, changes in the ocean or tidal levels or all kinds of other different things. Um, their primary goal is to push money out to institutions like Scripps Institution of Oceanography or Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution um, and universities across the country in order to fund their research. So a lot of people in NOAA will say, uh, you know, leadership is, you know, we're, we're not a science agency, we're a data agency. Um, but ultimately, we still fund a ton of research and kind of, I would say, oversee it per se, but we facilitate the flow of money into a lot of research. And that's what OAR primarily does. Uh, National Weather Service, again, near and dear to me uh, as a, as a, well, I won't even say prior meteorologist because I think we all know that when you sail, you kind of have to be, <laughs> kind of have to be a meteorologist as well. Um, you know, I at least have a, a solid handle on it. But uh, the NWS, which I'm very sorry that they don't have a better website, that's one of my biggest complaints, um, uh, especially from a meteorological standpoint. But um, ultimately, they provide all of our weather and climate data. So much like the Met Office in the UK. Uh, they provide um, weather warnings, weather uh, data and information. And of course, we have a lot of commercial versions as well that, you know, we can argue back and forth who's better, who's not better. But uh, we do have a really solid trained cadre of, uh, you know, weather forecasters that are pretty committed to what they do all across the nation. And um, I really enjoy the weather service. I used to work for them at our National Data Buoy Center. Uh, down in uh, beautiful Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. Um, it was out in the middle of the woods. It was a very interesting experience, but uh, needless to say, um, the Weather Service is a really neat organization. And again, it, it's a very old organization. That's the thing. Some of these organizations, both fisheries, and in this case, you know, the Weather Service have been around since the, um, you know, mid to late 1800s. And if you actually go back to the Coast and Geodetic Survey, which is still kind of under um, the National Ocean Service, which we'll cover next, you know, goes back to 1807 and was originally founded by Thomas Jefferson. Um, so, you know, they, they took all these things and they kind of put them all into one organization. And they're like, yeah, figure it out, make it work. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of works. <laughs> We do very good in our own little areas, but we could do better as a team. Um, that's something that I'm, I'm, I wish I could improve more. But um, so that's the weather service. And again, when we get to the end, we can go more in depth on, on any of these in particular. 
um, National Ocean Service. So, you know, the mission. National Ocean Service provides data tool services to protect our ecosystems and enhance climate and economic resilience. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, you know, science-based solutions through collaborative partnerships, blah, blah, blah. But the best thing to do is look at the program offices. So National Ocean Service obviously has, you know, anything to do with the ocean, it falls under here. So we've got, you know, uh, what's called Co-op Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. They make all of our tide tables and they provide current calculations and they've got a, a program called Ports and um, Ports is really interesting. Um, if you go in here, I'm not going to give a demonstration right now because it'll, it'll take too much uh, time and effort, but Ports, you can go in depending, assuming that your port participates in all the major ones do, you know, LALB, New York, so on and so forth. And you can pull up real time, current and tidal information uh, for that port. Um, so it's continually updating, monitored directly with, you know, actual, um, you know, tide gauges and stuff that are that are physically out there. So you can pull that information up at any time in order, you know, before you make your transit inbound turn to, to determine UKC uh, or, you know, whatever, your air draft, whatever you need to figure out, um, it's right there and it's live. So, um, Interesting things that they do there. Um, go back. National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. Again, sort of similar to OAR, but they're focusing really specifically on the coastal thing. With with climate change, you know, the concern is, is that we've got a lot of infrastructure in place that, you know, could be significantly impacted by any rise in, in ocean levels. Um, so they're there to kind of try to coordinate that fight, if you will. Um, National Geodetic Survey, I don't know how many people are into geodesy, um, but that was a huge part of, um, you know, NOAA core history. We were the guys that went out to the middle of nowhere and set up, you know, geodetic, um, you know, uh, oh, what do they call them? I forgot. But the things that, that allow them to measure the differences in height and the surface of the earth. Um, still very critical, but also not very well known. And in fact, if you look at any of our, our devices, I don't know if you can see it in there, but inside of there is what's called the geodetic triangle. So, and even my sleeve devices here, it's the geodetic triangle. So um, the NOAA Corps still loves geodesy, even though I personally have done absolutely nothing with it. Um, Office of Coastal Management. Uh, again, this, this plays in, they tie in tightly with the science of the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Um, Office of the Coast Survey, this one is pretty interest, you know, uh, of interest to us. These are our chart makers. So just like, uh, at, you know, the Admiralty and Admiralty charts, um, NOAA, you know, produces the charts, you know, here. Well, overseas hydrographic survey within the United States, let's put it that way. Um, so National Ocean Service is significant, also plays a very big role in the NOAA Corps and, and our, our various hydrographic ships, which I'll discuss later. A uh, couple of other ones, National Marine Sanctuaries, they manage our sanctuaries, we have multiple sanctuaries around the U.S., and we can go into this later if you want. Um, Office of Response and Restoration is basically a coordination a uh, tool used between the Coast Guard, uh, you know, the uh, oil and gas industries, and then obviously, you know, the environmental side of the house in relationship to, to us and EPA uh, in order to ensure that we are able to respond in a timely manner to limit the impacts to the ocean environment during an oil spill or something to that effect. And then last but not least, IUS, which is very similar to what National Data Buoy Center is part of. Um, it is basically our integrated ocean observing system, and that can play into you know, buoy networks, uh, glider networks, all the other networks that are out there and, and, and integrating them, not only under just you know, a national plan, but in theory, an international plan um, to monitor our environment. Jonathan, so, sorry, I'm so, sorry, to, sorry to butt in. Please, um, please. I'm just wondering, is there a tech issue here? Are you clicking on links which you expect us to be seeing? Because all we've oh, got, at the, I all got at the moment is the initial slide. I'm not sure whether the, the links are working. Oh, wow. Ah, How's that's, that? that's, ah, 
I, I apologize, everyone. Okay, well, uh, again, not really relevant, or I, I guess not all that horribly relevant. Now, let me go back here. I'm sure. So, so you've been seeing that the whole time. Ah, I'm so sorry. Okay, well, anyway, that's fine. Um, I was going to the web pages and kind of reading back some of those items. So I sincerely apologize. That 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 was. I was hoping that was going to make it a little more interactive and fun, um, but so is so is life and i am just putting those links in there if anyone wants to look at them uh broke it down by by the different weather by the different um organizations and that's really all i was doing before was going in and, and talking about each of the individual services so um i apologize for that um the joys of technology as chris and i were talking about your earlier. descriptions have been adequate don't you worry <laughs> oh what Good, good. Well, now you got the link, so you can look at it and get a little more in depth all you want. And again, we can come back to this during questions. So last but not least, though, is Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. And like I said, I'm going to spend a little more time on this because that's kind of my area. And I think the area you'll be interested in. Um, again, you know, we can all of our wonderful mission vision statements. You know, everyone wants to, uh, you know, come across and, you know, make their mark. So everyone's got to have a mission and vision statement. So those are ours. Uh, but our, our goal is to ensure that we have got the ability to gather the data needed for, you know, our nation's decision makers to make logical, sensible, science-based decisions. <laughs> and I, I know as you watch CNN and look at some of our politics, uh, you might roll your eyes at that. Um, I know I do. So needless to say, um, we this is what we do and it's kind of our, our ultimate goal. Um, you know, our personnel, we have a very diverse workforce, and this is sort of what I'm saying. We've got this strange setup where we have commissioned officers, right? Um, so he says, no core officers serve in OMEO's operational leadership positions at sea, in the air, and ashore. And then we also have public health service officers, which most people don't know about. So, you know, America now with the Space Force has nine, or sorry, eight uniformed services. Uh, so the Public Health Service and the NOAA Corps are two of the very much lesser known ones. Um, the NOAA Corps, well, let, let me put it to you this way. Uh, the Public Health Service has almost 6,000 officers assigned to it. Uh, the NOAA Corps has 320. So we are by far the smallest uniform service uh, in, in all of the U.S. Um so we have these commissioned officers. We have civilians that are, you know, civilian government uh, employees, um, civil servants, if you will. Um, we obviously have contractors that, that that fill in a lot of the blanks, and then we have professional civilian mariners. So people, normal human beings, I guess, uh, that you know uh, have their have their license or their their rating or whatever the case may be and they sail on our ships. So our typical ship structure will have no core officers in command, and we are the deck officers. We, we do all the deck safety operations, all those types of things. And then our engineering officers are civilian licensed engineers. And then all of our deck folks, the stewards, our survey department, all those people are uh, you know civilian uh, mariners. So very unique, very different from the Navy or the Coast Guard or anything you'd see there. And at the same time, very different from any type of commercial version of, you know, the maritime world, because you have these commissioned officers that are up on the bridge, uh, you know, theoretically driving the ship. Theoretically, I can get into that later. So again, commissioned officer corps. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, again, you know, one of the eight uniform services. Um, we rotate between sea and shore, um, increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of scientific operations. Um, I will say we are we are very unique within NOAA, and I do believe a significant strength in NOAA um, is the fact that we are uh, able to operate throughout all the line offices. I kind of mentioned before that they kind of get just put into their little area. They got made part of NOAA and a lot of them have been put very much into a uh, stovepipe, if you will. And so the weather service worries about the weather service. Fisheries worries about fisheries. OMAO supports all of them 
and Newell Corps officers serve in every single line office. So we get way more perspective of the big picture than a lot of folks do. Um, I don't know if that's, I believe it's a good thing, but I think we could use a lot more of it within the organization. So very unique in that respect. Uh, again, these are just some, some fun pictures, if you will, of uh, people out and about. Um, uh, you know, just because these guys are in the blue suits, the, the the pilots and stuff, everyone in the crew wears those. So regardless if they're uh, they're they're officers or uh, you know civilians, um, they're in that. Uh, but like on our ships and whatnot, you know, the officers are generally in uniform. The crew is uh, you know not. We also have our diving program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so we have a lot of divers, and that's officers, civilians, everyone can become a diver if, if they want to. And I mean, obviously, if it's necessary for their job. And then, you know, over here, I, I kind of point out the small boat program. Um, there's a lot. We have a ton of small boats. And we'll go into that a little bit, about 500 of them uh, to do our various missions out there. So, again, 15 ships and 10 highly specialized aircraft. I mean, the ships are pretty specialized, too, at this point. Uh, some of the older ones are pretty straightforward, but the newer ones are a little more in-depth. Um, so, again, we support uh, stock and marine mammal assessments, ecosystem studies, uh, ocean exploration, mapping, uh, coral reef preservation and protection. So, each ship generally has a different mission. We've got about five ships called fishery survey vessels, which we're going to get into in-depth in a little bit. Um, but ultimately there's, there's a, a whole bunch of different, uh, different missions out there and some ships do certain things and other ships don't, um, the aircraft, they collect all kinds of different things. We have her, you know, planes that fly into hurricanes, uh, regularly, you know, puncture the eye and fly through the eye wall. Um, we have them doing snow surveys where they go up and, and, you know, determine the depth of snow using LIDAR in order to determine the amount of water that's going to be, you know, coming down into the river systems, which affects our inland navigation significantly. Um, and so that way we can kind of put that warning out early so that they know that, hey, we could have issues later on. And again, all ties back into economics. We may not be able to move grain down the Mississippi because we're going to be in drought conditions much like we are right now. Again, you know, the ships, uh, you know, we're, we're able to go pretty much anywhere. I was part of Deepwater Horizon. When Deepwater Horizon happened, we sent down two of our ships, um, the fishery survey vessels, because we have some very, uh, you know, high acuity uh, type, um, you know, survey uh, sonars that are able to go and we were able to detect bubbles coming up through the wellhead. Um, and determine if it was leaking or not leaking, so on and so forth. So we can respond to a multitude of things, um, as you can see here. So multi-mission platforms, um, you know, capable of supporting all NOAA programs, um, depends on the platform, but some are, are very multifaceted. Then again, more pictures of people doing things, uh, you know, bridge scene, you know, CTD down here. We can get into the, I've got some better pictures of that when we get into, you know, my particular vessel. Ships and home ports. Uh, you can see, you know, the, the ships and what they do based on color. Um, so, you know, the, the nautical charting mission is covered by Thomas Jefferson uh, out of Norfolk, Ferdinand and Hassler, which is up in the Northeast, Newcastle, um, New Hampshire, and Fairweather and Rainier, which are on the West Coast, uh, Newport and Ketchikan, Alaska. Newport, Oregon is where the Rainier is based out of. Um, fisheries research are the green ones, Dyson up in Alaska, Alaska, San Diego, uh, Gunter, Oregon too, and Pisces, all out of Pascagoula, but they support operations uh, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, as well as up and down the East Coast. Uh, Ron Brown, which sails all over the world, and Nancy Foster out of Charleston. And then we have a couple that are up there in New England as well, which is Okeanos Explorer and Henry Bigelow. And then SETI, Oscar Elton SETI is out in Honolulu. That was my ship when I was the, the chief officer on there. Uh, I think, yeah, that tore us all on. These are the aircraft. I am not a pilot, um, so... Hey, aircraft, they fly, they do things. Um, I do know these two, the Orion and the, the Gulf Stream. 
Um, they're, they're very hurricane focused. They do some really cool stuff, uh, especially for weather nerds. Um, and then the other ones do a lot of surveys for marine mammals and snow surveys, etc. War pictures have some good pictures in here. Uh, you know, at, right there. You know, they're launching uh, a drone off there. We've actually we have a whole separate organization dedicated to uh, to um, you know UAVs and uh, UUVs and all the fun autonomous vehicles that are out there. We've got a whole thing dedicated to that because I think we all recognize that that's uh, going to be something that happens in the future. Like I said, no diving program. Um, discussed that a little bit before, but we have about 400 divers completing over 15,000 dives annually. And that's to actually go gather data and science, um, as well as ship hubs and and some other oddball things that, uh, that can occur um, across our, our unique fleet. Small boat program, as I mentioned, about 500 boats, 20 states. Um, you know, my, my previous ship, uh, the uh, SETI, the one out in Hawaii, we load up like seven uh, small boats onto the ship uh, that were not, you know, our rescue boat or anything like that. And then we, you know, would sail out to whatever remote island and deploy the boats and they would go do fishery surveys off the boats. Uncrewed systems, as I was saying, you know, something that we're, we're, we're moving forward with. Uh, we actually have the headquarters for this down at the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, down in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, and we are, it's also in conjunction with National Data Buoy Center, which has a huge glider fleet as well. So um, doing a lot of different uncrewed systems things, both in the water and in the air. Ruben Lasker, my, my, my former baby, no longer my baby, um, but I was commanding officer of this ship from 2020 until 2022 during COVID. Tons of fun. Loved every moment of it. Um, that was a little bit of humor. Um, loved being on the ship, but the COVID stuff was was a real pain. Uh, but that is, you know, her starboard side profile. This is her port side profile uh, at night uh, down in San Diego. San Diego was the home port. CTD operations, so just kind of showing here, you can see that, um, you know, this is basically a, an instrument that collects water. Uh, it also measures, you know, the temperature, depth, and salinity uh, of the water as it goes down. We will take that down, you know, thousands of meters. I have, you know, 5,500 meters of cable uh, on the ship uh, in order to, uh, you know, put her down. I actually have more than that, but that's the limit. Um, so it depends where we're at. But, um, but as you can see there, you know, it, it basically gets put off the side. You know, we're at a stop and we're basically holding position while we do that. And sometimes those operations will take up to, you know, one and a half to two hours, depending on how many collections and levels they need to go to. Other over the side operations, basically we, we drag various nets. Those nets on the left side, they, they call them bongos because um, they kind of look like bongos. Um, there's other terms for that, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep those to myself for now. Uh, but needless to say, uh, that's used to uh, acquire plankton um, so we can measure plankton and, and things of that nature, um, you know, and, and determine the overall ecosystems. You know, it's ecosystems-based fisheries management is what they're looking at. So um, we do those before we do the big trawls. Um, we can also deploy buoys. We deployed a couple buoys while I was out there, also retrieving buoys. So uh, again, we talk kind of about multi-mission. We can do a multitude of different things. Uh, but ultimately, fishing is the mission. Um, that, that, that is what we were out there doing. So um, we would bring those fish up, and then you see the scientists on the right there. They go through, measure the fish, measure their weight, measure their um, stomach contents, their odorless to figure out how old they are. Um, and you know, the thing is we've got acoustic sounders on the bottom of the ship that can determine the type of fish, the, the relative size of the fish and, and, you know, how many there are, but even with all that technology, we still don't know what they're eating. Uh, you know, we still don't know how old they are. Um, and they're hoping that eventually they can get to a technological point where they could possibly determine that, 
but they really don't know how to how to fix the the, the eating issue. So we still have to go out there and do some fishing, um, and then then go through the samples individually. And uh, frankly, I feel that's kind of a lot of fun. So um, bridge operations. This is our bridge team. Again, these are all commissioned officers that you see in front of you. Uh, this is my my beloved bridge team. As we're inbound to San Diego, um, as you can see, you know standard bridge setup. Um, when we're going in and out, we do have a fair amount of people on the bridge. But I mean, that's literally my entire wardroom. So we've got, you know, an OOD um, that, that usually has the con. Um, and then we've got our, uh, you know, someone on the helm and someone on the sticks and then a navigator watching our radars and, and ectus and all that fun stuff. And then I generally walk around as, as overall safety. And again, we can go into particulars on on that during questions here, but uh, operating stations, you know, we got the starboard side. That's where we do a lot of our, our over the side operations from. And then that aft station, which is on the right side, that's where we do our fishing from. So you're looking out the back, but you know, <laughs> you, you still have control of everything going forward. So it's, it's interesting, especially in uh, any type of traffic situation. And so without further ado, I will I will open up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing this so we, we can actually see each other. And if we want to go back to reference anything, I'm, I'm very happy to do so. Um, but, uh, you know, again, questions, thoughts, feelings, we can go from here. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I think that's been a uh, very enlightening um, uh, presentation there with all the things that you've done in your career and what actually goes on at this. So uh, I will... Um, anyone hands up or how do you want to work this? What's the easiest? Ian, have you got something? Oh, yeah. A finger up first. Ian. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks Thanks very much for a fantastic uh, presentation. Can you just go back to the last slide, please, for, with your uh, contact details, please? Yes, yes, yes. Let me and then share screen. Uh, contact. You're a bit quick on the button, you see. Oh, and then, ah, come on. Oh, whoop. there you That's go. Fine. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. Another one, Ian? Or the back no, that, that's, that's good now. I just want the contact details. Cool. Oh, you want the contact? Oh, I thought you were... <laughs> I thought you were talking about the bridge operations there. No, no, just just the last screen, as I say. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, there you go. That's that's my contact info. And uh, yeah, other questions? Uh, I've got just a, a comment, Jonathan. If I may, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely impressed. I mean, it's a it's a mega organization. I know you said it's only a sort of small cohort of people, but crikey, the breadth of uh, operations is 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 amazing. Um, I should think. You said before we came online that we were, we were having a chat that this is probably unique in the world. Um, I would imagine most nations are <coughs> quite envious of what you've got. So the question is, do you do you what what is it, what is the international cooperation? I mean, do you share your data? Do you work with other nations, or do you keep it to yourself? <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 very, very, very much so. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was on uh, SETI, we had people from um, uh, the King Abdullah, King Abdullah University uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, and they were out there conducting, uh, you know, research on various um, corals and things of that nature. So you know, we 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 build them in. So yeah, a lot of our ships have international people coming on. Uh, Canadians, we do a lot of work with the Canadians, obviously. And then even on Lasker, um, you know, we survey from basically the tip of the northern tip of Vancouver Island all the way down uh, to Cabo San Lucas. So um, we had Mexican scientists on board, and yeah, we 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 share um, well pretty much all that data. I mean, if they're there's rarely anything classified or anything of that nature. Um, but we are working toward more data sharing. Um, I know like specifically in fisheries, again, because science and technology, that also has our, our data side of the house. And they're working, uh, we just had one of our data specialists that was, uh, I believe she was in the Netherlands last, or Belgium. She was in Belgium uh, last week attending a, a huge European data conference um, on, on fisheries data. So yeah, no, it's, uh, 
it's a surprisingly international organization in that respect, uh, because, you know, we, we recognize that science kind of, you know, spans the globe and, you know, the fish, the fish don't see borders. Um, so <laughs> uh, we got to got to share where we can. I suppose just one one other question, John, that is seeing the, the number of ships and personnel involved. How much training do you actually manage to get? Like cadets in the UK, we struggle with getting cadets onto ships and get cadets trained up to, to get the qualifications through. I mean, how many cadet trainee type people do you get going through on the ships that go through? And what, what is the score with that? So, you know, it's um, <laughs> it's interesting. We've actually had, I don't know, um, we actually had a Cal Maritime cadet out on one of our ships not too long ago. Um, like, like literally just this, this, this past semester. Um, so Noah is, is kind of strange and this is, I, I feel, I don't say deficiency, but because Noah Corps is operating the deck side of the house, uh, in general, you know, not, he can't really be a deck officer in Noah unless you're a commissioned officer. And we train our people, um, sort of in-house. Um, I mean, we have contractors that come in and do some of the training, and then we also work very closely with the Coast Guard. Coast Guard, OCS, and NOAA OCS are integrated. Um, and then, like, we used to be taught at the, the Merchant Marine Academy, actually. Um, but again, that was kind of through a contract setup. So for cadets coming on board, um, I, I think it's something like there's about three or four that come aboard throughout the, the year um as uh you know generally in the engineering side of the house uh so they can you know go 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 get some of their sea time in that respect um but it is it is a challenge because it always comes up with the scientists that are coming on board you know hey we need bunk space we need to get more scientists and we're like yeah we need to put this engineer on and you know they they kind of wince at that but that's some of the fun political balancing that we have to do mm. um yeah, thanks for Colin, uh, Colin Legger, who works for the MCA, um, asks about paper charts uh, in the States. Massive debate going on across the world about um, the digitalization of charts and what's going to happen to paper ones. What's, this, what's the state of the uh, debate in the States? Uh, we're phasing them out. Uh, <laughs> um, we're, we're phasing them out uh, in, over time. Um, the data is still there, so there's commercial printers that will will print the charts uh, if you want printed charts. But the reality is, is that um, it, it's going to end up being a, a, a commercial process if people want printed charts. So that will all depend on the market. Ultimately, Office of Coast Survey is phasing out, you know, paper chart data uh, over time. Um, they have started actually an, an issue we had on Lasker was that, you know, we were up there and uh, they, they weren't making the charts anymore. And we didn't have a, um, well, long story short, um, we, we weren't prepared for the transition to, you know, uh, e-charts uh, quite yet on some of our ships. Fortunately, since I had pretty much the newest ship in the fleet, um, we were set up and we were able to go electronic and it wasn't an issue, but it's starting to affect some of our older ships that just don't have the full IMO compliant capability. Um, but yeah, phasing them out slowly but surely. And yeah, there's a lot mm -hmm. of interesting argument, but in, in uh, American fashion, they're like, well, the market will figure it out and someone will probably still be producing it, but they're going to have to somehow transfer that data between office coat survey and what they need to do to make the actual proper paper chart. Talk, talking of Alaska, Jonathan, have you surveyed Seward Bay yet? Because I can remember being up there 40 years ago on hand, hand drawn charts. <laughs> um, well, I personally haven't. Um, yeah. I believe they have, but there are, so the reason, so the Rainier, even though it says it's based out of Newport, Oregon, well, it bounces around, but it spends a lot of time up in Alaska because of that reason, because there are literally, uh, you know, things that have not been surveyed up there since the mid 1800s. And uh, it, it, it is it can be a little hairy, but uh, I think they are making pretty solid progress. Last I heard, I think it was like 85 uh, percent is uh, at least done within the past 30 years. 
Yeah, we we got some very very dodgy soundings going up there, and turned around and came back out pretty quick, and it turned out to be Moraine in suspension. Huh. It was uh, we sent we sent the data to you guys, and you yeah. came back and said no, it's deep water, but you you did get some felt some odd soundings because of this suspension in the water. Incredible. Yeah, yeah it happens. Uh, Colin, did you have your hand up? Oh. Um... Yeah, no, I just had my hand up when you were talking about cadets because I was gonna, I was just gonna throw in there that it's uh, Noah is is something that really, really does interest a lot of our cadets. Uh, we have a lot of people, you know, come through our program, um, especially maybe in the more recently, uh, who are you know really interested in going to sea and really want to sail and really want you know to be a uh, get their certificate of competence, but they're maybe not so um, they're they're more interested in environmental work than maybe carrying crude oil. And so they're really attracted to NOAA. And, and so we have a, a a marine sciences minor that a lot of the MT, the marine transportation students will take. And, and that really, that helps them. We also have an oceanography major, but that doesn't include a license. So yeah, we do see a lot of, uh, a lot of interest with the marine transportation students who want to do the uh, marine science minor and maybe go to NOAA. So it's, it's a really popular, uh, popular career option for a lot of our people. That's all. Awesome. And it's it's interesting because, you know, it's it's one of those things when we get people that and I was talking I was talking to someone up there, um, a, a student. And, and, and it was one of those things where it's like they wanted, you know, to come and, and join, you know, Noah and, and sail, you know, as a deck officer. That was kind of their background. And, you know, it's like, well, you have to become no core officer. Then. And they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do all that. Um, and so it's 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 a double-edged sword uh, organizationally because, you know, a, an engineer, not a problem, but the uh, deck just really has, has, has kind of some barriers there. And then we do have this thing called survey techs and survey techs are kind of our shipboard permanent scientists, if you will, because the scientists will rotate a lot, you know, it depends on what the ship's doing, but there is these survey techs are like the data stewards on the ship. Um, and do a lot of science related stuff. So that might be something that would interest those individuals. The problem is, is when I talk to them, they're like, oh, great, what do they get paid? And I'm like, well, they start out at 36,000 a year and they kind of say, oh, that's, that's wonderful. I'm going to go sail now, thanks. <laughs> um, so that's another, another issue we face too, is that, I mean, we, we are all facing you know, a staffing crisis, um, but the reality is, is we have a hard time competing because yeah. yeah, I know one of one of my very very outstanding former students is a second engineer on on a on one of the NOAA ships. She said she's in like Vermont or someplace out there yeah. now. So really yeah. excited to see how. Jonathan uh, Derek asks specifically about Antarctic charts. Presumably, there's a specific issue there, is there? Hmm. Uh, or are they? I don't know what the chart. What's the chart situation like in the Antarctic? Well. I really don't know. From Beth's not great, I think, because that's what Beth said, wasn't it, Chris? On the last mm -hmm. presentation, she said they were not great. Yeah, I think I think there's, I mean, so again, you know, Noah responsible for, you know, US territories, possessions, states, whatever. Um, we focus on 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 our coasts um much more than we do other places, because frankly, we can can't have a hard time keeping up with what we have. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. That's that's definitely not my proverbial wheelhouse. But yeah, I've I've heard the same thing that they're they're questionable at best. Yeah. Any other any other questions we got on the? I can see anybody else there. I can't see anything else coming up. Um, well, John, Jonathan, I'd like to thank you again. That's been a really interesting and a really positive uh, discussion there. And uh, I'm sure once Chris is uh, sorted out the, the tech again, we'll probably share share that around to more because a lot of the committee and a lot of the the, the the branch this time of night can be a challenge for some of them so hopefully we can share it and they'll get to to watch it in retrospect and if there's any questions we can ping them over to you as well to to talk through but i think a round of applause from everybody for yourself i think that'd be a, a great virtual thank you very much indeed and uh chris have you got any other little bits we want to just square up with When's the next? Um... No, I just want, like to add my thanks to yours, if I may, Adrian. Thank you, Jonathan, for a really informative um, presentation. I've learned a lot. Thank you.
looking ahead, we're going to take a break, obviously, over the holiday period, over Christmas. I wish everybody a peaceful and relaxing Christmas. I hope you have a good one. Um, and we'll come back in January. Uh, at the moment, we've got something planned for the 17th of January when uh, Captain David McMillie uh, uh, is going to talk to us about we, We've got this a rather interesting steam-powered tug in the northwest of the UK called the uh, Danny Adamson, Danny Adamson. And it's it's a working tug. It's um, uh, it's still it, it does charters and tr chugs up and down a canal. So he's going to talk to us about that. He's a, he's one of the masters on there, and that's on the seventeenth of January. But there'll be a flyer produced over the holidays and hopefully out in the, in the beginning of January. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for logging on. Well done. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks to all, and uh, yeah, same same. Happy Christmas and uh, take take care all. Keep safe over the winter. We'll see you in January. And I do hope you'll rescue that Father Christmas behind you. I, he's, he's flying <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go wrong. But yeah, um, thanks all again one, for <laughs> Keep safe and we'll speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thanks, thanks, thanks Bye now.